Right. Um, like, where does it come from? I think it comes from an imperfect understanding of the infinite reality that would be God if God existed. Right. That it just is. And, or the fact, or the fact that people are uncomfortable with if 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 everything that exists in creation was created, then that means horrible things were created for a reason. Yeah. Or you could go the Gnostic route and go, there are two gods. Yeah. There's the god that created everything, and that's why everything's shit, because that god is evil as fuck. And then there's the other god that's come to rescue us from that. From, from existence? Yes, from existence. <laughs> the evil god created the Matrix, and we're all stuck here, and it's horrible. And uh, the better god came along and was like, I can free you from this. Let's have a show on philosophy, Jim Davis. Let's talk let's about. Talk about I'd be happy to talk. But I think let's philosophy talk about the gods. Enriched my D and D experience quite immensely. What's that? Sure. Yeah. Are you filming now? So, Jim, are we in the Matrix? Are we in a computer simulation? I mean, does it matter? would be my real question, I think. that and that's why I think I like Dungeons & Dragons, because you are simulating a world. Yeah. It might not be with a computer that has AI and everything, but if you treat the people in it as if they're real people, then you are, in fact, hyper-intelligent beings creating a simulated environment that that's then populated by entities that you play with as if on your own whim. So it's all a matter of uh, what you're willing to suspend <laughs> your disbelief about. Right. It's my favorite way of playing Dungeons & Dragons. It's pretending as if the place is real. Yeah. Is it, and the, the people and, and NPCs and PCs are real people and shit. But I like philosophical D&D because I think it enriches the world building experience. And those might uh, say that, well, isn't that why Dungeons and Dragons is dangerous? Because you could lose your grip on reality. Sure. But I just think back to like um, the cartoons of the, the sheepdog and the, and the wolf uh -huh. going in, clocking in together. Right. They go in, they do their job, and then they clock Come out, on. right? Yeah. It's kind of like that. As the DM and the players, you're like, all right, we're going to go in and we're going to do this thing we're because this, this thing. is what we're supposed to do. Uh -huh. Some things we know exist in Dungeons & Dragons are a soul. We know that a soul exists in yeah. D&D. And so where does that soul live before it inhabits a body? Is And so I, I go to platonic philosophy for that. I go, like, there's a, a realm of forms that exist independently of the world. And mm -hmm. it's people reside. Maybe you can travel there with magic in some Yeah, way. you exist as a higher, like an incorporeal consciousness. Right. Yeah. And then you come here. You well, it's it's kind of like, you remember that one game I ran where it was like, you guys, we started the campaign literally at the instant of creation of the world. Yeah, yeah. It was like, there's nothing, and then you hear a clarion call of creation, and suddenly existence is around you, and it's mutable, and, and, and weird. the sun doesn't always rise at the same place or the same time. And right, because that hasn't been set yet. It hasn't yet. been set yet, and then, you know, distance is a more of matter of, of will and intention than, like, any objective sort of sense, and, like, slowly the world solidifies and becomes objective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more we did things in right. areas, like, things became permanent. It's been, like, active, purposeful action. Mm -hmm. in an area it set it in stone and it was just like these two poles of the primal and the ethereal sort of the, the mind and the body coming together to create a world and and different characters were a, a mix of, of some were more body some were more mind and mm -hmm. that homebrew that I ran was was very philosophical to me in its underpinnings if not necessarily it's uh, the execution of it but I know there's a lot of fun things you can do. Like, what are the gods? Like, what are they? They're not all powerful. They have their specific little niche that they... Yeah, they have a purview, a domain. But then there's, it's like, who created the planes in Dungeons & Dragons? Is, is, it a, is it a creation? Is it some, or is it just the natural outgrowth of, of cosmic forces that create mm -hmm. these things and then are from it arise kind of sentient beings and then their activity gives rise to deities and gods and things like that. That's how I've always liked to see it, is like there were no gods before people in Dungeons and Dragons world invented them. But the right. difference is is that when they invented gods in Dungeons and Dragons worlds, they invented real beings with yeah. real power that, yeah. exo that, that exist on these planes. Yes, their, their belief and uh, aligning of purpose and, and ritual uh -huh. gave rise and form right. to these beings. To these beings, yeah. And I, filled I, them with the power that they then ask back. So, they, they, so yeah, they, does they, that they, mean they, that they, we they, are God in that case? I mean, if you take it literally, then yes, the players in the DM are the real gods of a D&D &D setting. Everything else is just fiction. 
you know, it's just a narrative that forms around it. And I think that if you were to take it literally and like this place is real, these characters are real. Forgotten Realms is a real place that you could, that you could, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter that it just exists on paper and in people's imaginations. Like, right. you could pretend that these things people are real. The thing that I really like thinking about is like the philosophy of magic. It's like, who was the first person, the first, the first people to practice magic, to harness magic? What mm -hmm. is magic? I kind of think like druidic magic would be the first magic that comes about. Well, the magic of the natural world. Yes. Because, I mean, all things come from the natural world, so right. it would seem that there should be some kind of sustaining force that you could then harness. You could then harness and manipulate, and then, like, after that, I kind of see clerical magic is coming next, the natural world, mm -hmm. the natural processes, and then there's gods that govern those things, which the then gives rise to... Right, then gives rise to the clerical magic, faith-based, and devotion to, an, to another world. And then later on, arcane magic comes about, because it's like, well, we, we don't need to worship the natural forces, we can harness them, we don't need to worship personalized entities that we've kind of unconsciously created we can like harness this magic ourselves for our own purposes and, and maybe like warlock magic came first contract with one of these beings and share in its power mm -hmm. or maybe sorceress magic came first because it was like these just from within just from within and then later on wizardly magic is sort of the apex of that because it's like well we're people who aren't connected to the arcane otherwise are able to study and harness and mm -hmm. i don't know that's why i like jack vance so much because they go in so so much detail about how spells work and what they are and yeah yeah these brain demons <laughs> that that you have to spend a lifetime learning to control and you can only carry like three or four of them in your mind at the same time mm -hmm. and then real wizards oh, yeah they consume your intellect yeah, right yeah. That, they, that they summon entities that perform the magic for them whatever they're called San sandisons or, or uh, it's been too long man yeah it's been a while since i read them but the ones where it's like you summon this creature yeah who then enacts the spell but lesser wizards just like go through the motions and kind of create the same spell effects with them. I don't know. Yeah, well, in that case, you know, wizardly magic is like the the enlightenment, like the renaissance of magic. In a right? way, in like a way, where you're, yeah. Where you're you're getting to the rational thinking about it, and in, and the uh -huh. fact and accepting the fact that this is a pre-existing force. Right. And it can be manipulated. It can be it manipulated, can be... and it and it like and it's predictable, right? Yes. Like the, the the way magic works in Dungeons and Dragons, it's it's this a fireball is a fireball. It works right. the way it works. Now, I sometimes like taking the, the assumption that the magic in the player's handbook is a ideal form of certain spells and that there are fireballs out there that have variable characteristics than the right. fireball spell that's there. Yeah, or, a radiant fireball or a fireball that doesn't blow up into a ball per se. Or, some, or, or ones that are unstable and mm -hmm. the range on them is, is you know, makes them dangerous to cast or, or even just like a throwback to other editions where it's like, yeah, you don't want to cast this spell in, in a tight corridor or in an enclosed space because it'll... Mm -hmm. Kill everybody. Yeah, there's a set amount of force that's going to come out, <laughs> right. and based on the dimensions of where it comes out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but like the fact that, that spells have a, they work for usually a fixed duration. I mean, if not a fixed duration, as long as like you concentrate on them, or as long as someone keeps yeah. failing their saving throws. But it's like there's not enough variability in spells for them to be that random. They're pretty predictable, and you could study them. That line of thinking, though, that means that how many generations of wizards had to go through like study and refinement of the fireball right. to get it where it goes this how long those spells get it yeah how did those it spells get caught blows up it? to this big it uh -huh. does about it or do this much damage, like right. th to be like that refined mm -hmm. where you know if this is a scientific venture every time you cast a fireball you're just confirming is you're peer reviewing yeah right basically. and yeah. it's like yep nope that's a fireball that's how that works yeah. right yeah so maybe it's the player's handbook spells are the most studied the most well practiced and the most sort of available spells yeah and that there are really hundreds and hundreds of other spells that are less than or unreliable or something mm -hmm. like that and but they could be more but they could be more they just need refinement the, yeah that's why those uh, all those students that get turned away because they search for dangerous knowledge uh -huh. Uh -huh. and all they're trying to find is that variable fireball that variable fireball where's the first level summoning spell that lets you summon like a massive pit, pit fiend or something at first level like you know what I mean? That's the other thing about the about magic in fifth edition is like it's less dangerous to the user yeah. than than previous versions of magic. Or if Dungeons and Dragons magic was ever really dangerous to the user. But it's like those those stories of like, yeah, this apprentice wizard accidentally, <laughs> accidentally summoned something it shouldn't have. Well, there's not really yeah. a chance of that happening outside of the a DM. Scroll. The DM saying this is what happens. Yeah. Yeah, it takes or they, the, they find a scroll. Like right. that's a that's really kind of they might be able to with a scroll. Might they, be. Yeah. They roll a twenty on their check. 
And okay, well, you summoned a demon, Mr. First Level Wizard, with your right. two spells. With your two spells. And your yeah. two spell slots. Yeah. yeah. That protection from evil is only going to last like 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're effed in the A. Yeah. In that case, Jim Davis, yeah. we're in our real world of Forgotten Realms. Uh huh. Our, simu our, our real simulation. Our real simulation. Uh -huh. we're, we're playing Roy. Uh, we're not going to go back to the carpet store. No. No. Um, we're going to go out and go on the life of adventure. Roy is the best video game that could ever be created. That idea, right? right? I mean, every time we play D&D, &D, it is a, a, like, a, like a version of that idea. And, uh -huh. and to go back to the original kind of thing that started this whole conversation, yeah. which was, is this a simulation? Yeah. Like, in that case, aren't all games just like a meta, like, level down? Of just a simulation inside a simulation inside a simulation. I mean, if you assume reality as it exists as a simulation, then yeah. yeah. I, I don't. I think it's a clever mental exercise that a bunch of tech bullshit bros mm -hmm. like Peter Thiel and, and Elon Musk have latched on to and be like, well, yeah, we're all brains in a jar and a vat somewhere. It's just like, you can take your crazy ass bullshit. Yeah. And go out to Sealandia that you want to build yeah. and, yeah. and pedal that shit there. Yeah. Like just you know. so, you, so you don't buy into <laughs> it. I don't buy into it, no. See, for me, I, there, I think that reality is one of two things. Mm. And I think it is the simulation idea, but it's a little bit different. Yeah. I, do, I, I, would, like, I would like to believe uh -huh. that we are higher consciousness beings. Uh -huh. We are incorporeal. We have evolved past all of this. Okay. And this is to remind us of where we came from okay. and to keep our humanity. Because once you become incorporeal and you do anything, you could probably lose a little perspective. I right? could I could see something like that. It's it's a very shitty simulation. Well like, that's the thing is it's like designed a, it's to like keep a, you in it's check. It's like a hellscape simulator. Well, <laughs> again, life is you know, life is a dream. You know, you come down, this is real for while you're here. Uh huh. And then the second it's over, you wake up in the booth, you go out, you're like, all oh, right. And you go out and you have a drink with your buddies. Uh, you're like, dude, you're not gonna believe what I just fucking did. I, I went and did this, and went and did that, and if then I, I died doing this thing. If that's the case, I have a, I have a message for my player character, yeah. whoever they're out there, out there. Use some cheat codes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just use them. That's fine. I don't care. I don't know if you're one of those gamers who doesn't yeah. believe in cheating or yeah. hacking the game or fuck, anything. Fuck your next die roll. Fuck that. You should do that. Yeah. Wherever you are out there, player, uh, it's time to uh, it's roll time a couple of twenties. It's time to roll a couple of twenties up in this bitch. I I think that the the idea of it being a simulation is one of those things. It's a it's a clever exercise mm -hmm. in in sort of thinking about reality. But I'm not sure that I buy it. To me, it's just kind of like, what do you remember of before you were born? Well, nothing. nothing. You're not gonna. I just don't think there's anything. It's just like yeah. you get a little bit, and then well, you're see, done. I think that's where uh, part part partial instinct and habit comes from. Yeah, like where you have so certain instincts to do certain things uh -huh. or ways of behavior that don't really recon that that can't be reconciled by your experience. Uh huh. Uh, you know, and, and and that gives rise to people believing in reincarnation and previous lives. Sure. But if we're talking about this being a simulation where you have done previous things, then you might. Once you play the game long enough, remember certain little things about previous times you've been in it, right? So when you remake a character mm -hmm. that you played in a previous edition of Dungeons and Dragons, is that that's like a reincarnation? You're reincarnating it, that character. It completely idea. is. Yeah, that's, that's poor bastards. That's all you're doing. Hey, we, dude, Emma, how many times she reincarnated Fabian? Fabian's been reincarnated at least eight times. Yeah. So um, how's his soul doing? Well, I mean, if we take that one campaign, his soul's fine and well on its way to becoming a Solar or something like that. That's true. But everything from Fababian through the Lantern Archon that mm -hmm. Fabian eventually becomes, mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons is a simulated reality. I mean, it's a simulated reality. It's, that's what's yeah. the fun thing about it. You could do whatever you want with it and it's inflict horrible calamities on these people. It's a shitty life. I would not want to live in the Forgotten Realms. Yeah, it's a horrible it's place with dragons and monsters and demons that regularly and routinely flagrantly invade. I'd, I'd live in Eberron. I think Eberron might not be a bad place to live in if yeah. you're going to pick a place. Or um, I guess maybe if I was picking any place to live in, I'd pick probably the Blue Rose World. It's like a romantic fantasy setting where it's like a magic deer chooses... A magic deer looks into the heart of, of the candidates for king and picks the best one for the job. So it's you know that it's the most just, wise, kind monarch you could have. They probably live in something like that. So they have a magic deer here. We have, what is that? A, a, is it the octopus that picks things here <laughs> the octopus, on Earth? Right. It like floats down and picks like uh, uh, like winners of uh, the Olympics and all right. that. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's another way to think about it. Sure. Let's see. But yeah. 
whoever's out there controlling this thing, yeah. bust out the cheat codes. Yeah, this that's... is bullshit. <laughs> this is a bullshit simulation. You can do better. Recently, maybe just uh, they just need to reboot the computer. And then we'd all be dead. That's the dilemma, right? Like, that's the dilemma of it being a simulation is that this whole thing could end at any moment. And even mm -hmm. if you are a simulation, your existence is important to you. It's kind of yeah. like in Save or Dice. The simulacrum is not going to risk its life. It can't come back from the dead. Right. If it's, it can't be remade and it won't be the same. So yeah. that simulacrum's like, no, I'm not going to help you fight this demon. I want to live. I'm a, I'm a unique Right. Creation that has existence. So, so let me let me let me ask you another thing. This, uh -huh. is, this is my other uh -huh. other viewpoint of what this all could be. What if we are just the subatomic sub level of existence of a higher being? Uh -huh. As in our galaxy is basically kind of like a molecule. Uh -huh. Our solar system is the atom. We're rolling around on a freaking electron. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Because when you look down atoms kind of look like solar systems. You yeah, those, like, they're you sort of like mirror each other. Yeah, you, macro look those, and you look at those pictures of the universe and it, you put it next to a scan mm -hmm. of the brain of, you know, mm -hmm. and it looks almost the same, uh -huh. right? So what if that was the case and we are in fact basically just these microscopic entities inside the body of a higher being that's just probably, you know, maybe it's just a bird on a tree right now. Yeah. In, in its time scale, it's, you well, know, you a couple could, years old. Here's what I think about that. You need to attend some philosophy classes where they answer these kinds of questions. I, mean, I, I will. You, you should. They're really interesting. And the other one is just like, does it matter? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. It's, so in that case, it really doesn't matter. Say we're in a version of human uh -huh. on a higher level. Uh -huh. Would it not then behoove us to not have a space program and to not spread? Because in that scenario, we would technically be kind of like cancer. And if we spread and started affecting other areas, would that not then attract the attention of the higher entity in which we'd, a giant laser would burn us out of the sky as they... Uh, uh, I mean, do some might. kind of chemotherapy. And again, it, I suppose it might. this is why I can't get anything done because I think about this shit. You should really take a class. There's been, like, I'm serious, man. They've been thinking about this shit for thousands of years. And it Jim, can, I thought it, can it was be special. Very, it can be very helpful to I just like, help organize your thoughts. You know, you gotta, you, there's, the thoughts are not, I don't believe there's an original thought that's ever existed ever anywhere anymore. Who said that first? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm sure someone else has thought that. Well, by your own thinking, they would have to have thought that. Yeah, somebody else has already thought that and written a book about it. And yeah. there's a TED talk, I'm sure. And yeah, they uh, they got in a war over it. And yeah, mm -hmm. some philosopher thought it up, and his apprentice was like, "Sir, I read that in a book from a thousand I years ago." I read that in a book from a long time ago. Yeah. Well, shit. Yep. Well, that's how you get your mind blown. Yeah. Do you ever wonder if your D&D characters are actually real, living creatures in a real living world, and that you are fucking up their lives every single day? Or maybe this reality isn't actually real and we're all just brains in a jar in some Elithid's laboratory. That could be the case, or it couldn't, or does it really even matter? I don't know. Let's talk about it on WebDM. We're not even high right now. Yeah, not yet. <laughs>